When Larry Fink said that every stock, every bond will be on one global ledger, he's saying that tokenization is not a niche innovation. It's become a fundamental strategic pivot for the global financial system. While the idea of tokenizing assets isn't new, the concept started to really pick up steam back in 2017. Much has changed in the years since. From a broader exposure to and understanding of the benefits that blockchains can bring, to rising interest rates, to a changing regulatory environment. With it all, 2025 has become the year the world came on chain. I'm Danielle Tomasi. I'm a product manager at Chainlink Labs. And today, we're going to be talking about interoperability in this tokenized economy. We're at a turning point. We're moving from the pilot phase to seeing real production use cases take hold. A16Z just reported that stablecoins power 46 trillion in annual transaction volume. To put that in perspective, that's about three times the amount that Visa does per year and about half of the global ACH or the US ACH network. We've seen 75% growth of real world assets in the last year, but investors are hungry for more. State Street recently did a survey that found that 60% of institutional investors plan to increase their allocation in digital assets in the next year. We're seeing increased investment from launching tokenized products to tokenization platforms to even blockchains from traditional financial incumbents, the Fidelity, BlackRock, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs of the world, as well as from fintechs like PayPal and Robinhood and Stripe. So why the surge? First, the benefits are becoming increasingly clear, whether this is the operational efficiency associated with shortened settlement cycles and 24-7 markets, uh, or access to new liquidity that comes from uh, people that have on-chain capital that they want to put to use. Beyond that, we're starting to see the emergence of regulatory clarity that has eluded the space for too long. So it's the convergence of opportunity, of infrastructure, and of regulation for the first time. And yet, we're still in the first inning. BCG projects that we will reach 19 trillion in tokenized asset volume by 2033. So the takeaway is clear. Firms that don't explore tokenization risk being left behind. But because you guys are here, we know you're not in that category. So tokenization is accelerating, and it's happening across multiple venues, across both public and private chains. I often hear if people are asking if public or private chains will win out. And I think that that's really the wrong question. These systems will coexist because they serve different purposes within the financial stack. Public chains make sense when transparency, composability with DeFi, or access to new liquidity are of most importance. Here, we're seeing institutions like BlackRock and Franklin Templeton, as well as upstarts like Ondo and Spico, launch tokenized assets or funds on multiple blockchains. These institutions chose public chains because they want to reach more investors. They want to be able to tap into liquidity pools, and they want to enable composability. Private chains, on the other hand, make sense when privacy and governance and control are paramount. For example, banks managing tokenized deposits or repo markets. Here we're seeing individual banks launch their own chains, like JPM's Connexus or Citi's CDAP or HSBC's Orion. But we're also seeing consortia of institutions building shared networks, like Canton or Partier. Blockchains are still early on their adoption curve. There are scattered deployments across different chains, both public and private. And while at first this seems like a simple problem, just connect the two chains. As you can see in this diagram, the complexity increases fast. With blockchains, change is really the only constant. New blockchains are launched and announced what feels like daily. And ultimately, we know there will be winners. We know there will be some level of consolidation, but we don't know who they'll be yet. So you know you need to plug into this new world, but you don't know exactly what it's going to look like. And in the meantime, you're likely to have assets on one chain, investors that want them on another, and thus a need to connect the dots. You need interoperability between a growing number of unknown chains. Solving interoperability problems is not new to this industry. Interoperability is the engine of financial progress. Every major leap in financial infrastructure has come from connecting previously isolated ecosystems. I'll take us back to the 70s, when every bank or country had its own messaging format. Transfers were slow. They often required manual reconciliation. When SWIFT launched, 
created a common language for exchanging information between institutions, and that one layer of interoperability made global correspondent banking possible. A couple decades later, in the 90s, brokers, exchanges, and buy-side desks all had their own trading systems and order formats. When FIX protocol launched, it standardized how trading messages were sent and received, and suddenly, electronic trading took off. Years later, institutions were still using inconsistent data standards for payments and securities and FX. The ISO 20022 standard gave the industry a common language once again, improving automation, data quality, and ultimately paving the way for real-time payments and the modern treasury management system. The next problem we have, connecting blockchains. The many hundreds of blockchains that have been la uh, launched need to be interconnected in order to access the many benefits of tokenization. Connecting two chains is harder than connecting two databases via APIs. Why is that? Blockchains are like computers that aren't connected to the internet. They have no access to external data and systems. They're not built to work together. They often have their own logic. They could even be built in different languages. On top of that, you're not just moving data, you're moving value, and with it, ownership. This introduces three key challenges. The first is security. Bad interop, usually from weak verification or centralized systems, can lead to hacks. In fact, in DeFi, over $3 billion has been lost to hacks when using poorly built interoperability platforms. The second is compliance. Moving assets requires maintaining controls over who has access to hold a given asset and carrying that through to multiple different ecosystems while retaining clear audit trails. The third is privacy. Public blockchains are fully transparent by design. Privacy mechanisms, however, are required to protect the sensitive data that moves across chains, whether it's client data, trading strategies, or proprietary business logic. And of course, on top of all of that is resilience. We think about this as table stakes, but decentralized systems play a big role in ensuring continuity in cases like a few weeks ago when AWS uh, US East One region went down for 15 hours, taking with it many cross-chain providers. So what's clear is interoperability is important, but it's hard. You need an interoperability layer that is suited to the many complexities and nuances required for an institution. And this complexity continues to grow with a number of blockchains. This is why we built CCIP, the Cross-Chain Interoperability Protocol, the standard for secure, compliant, reliable transfers of data and value between blockchains, whether they're public or private. We abstract away the complexity. We allow institutions to connect tokenized assets to the on-chain economy through a single secure integration. One transaction can trigger an entire cross-chain workflow, and with it, all of the nuances of the underlying chains are taken care of. CCIP was built to solve those three key challenges, security, compliance, and privacy. CCIP is the only interoperability protocol that is both ISO 27001 and SOC 2 compliant, demonstrating our commitment to institutional grade infrastructure management and data security. We're already live on over 70 blockchains across multiple chain families, and we're expanding rapidly. And billions of value has already been transferred on CCIP that is itself built on top of Chainlink's decentralized Oracle network infrastructure that has enabled $26 trillion of value in DeFi. I'll share some examples to highlight how CCIP can enable compliance and privacy. Spico's money market funds are regulated by the French Financial Market Authority. Their use case is a great demonstration of how regulated financial products can move securely across chains without having to sacrifice on compliance. Leveraging CCIP, Spico enforces compliance policies to ensure that every cross-chain transaction adheres to its regulatory and investor eligibility requirements. How'd they do it? Well, this diagram is a bit complicated, but you can see that their implementation relies on allow lists and a contract called a defensive sender receiver that makes it impossible to send a money market fund to a receiving address that's not eligible to hold it. In cases where an attempt is made to send to an ineligible receiver, the system will reject the transfer and facilitate a secure return to the sender. In this example, ANZ and ADDX, an institutional tokenization platform based in Singapore, 
wanted to enable Australian investors to purchase and redeem uh, tokenized commercial paper across two private permission blockchains. To meet regulatory requirements, all of the transaction data, so the counterparties, the amounts, the balances, needed to remain completely confidential. CCIP private transactions enabled DVP settlement between these two chains in a completely private manner, ensuring that none of the key transaction data was visible to the node operators that participated in facilitating this transfer or any other third party. The example I just gave involves two private chains, but our newly announced confidential compute capability, you should have heard a bit about this yesterday in Sergey and in Purvis keynotes, will enable private transactions across any public or private blockchain. Privacy, of course, is one of the major inhibitors to institutions operating at any level of real scale on public blockchains. So we're very excited to bring the suite of, com uh, suite of capabilities from private transactions to confidential data distribution to privacy preserving uh, identity data to the market. There'll be a bunch more opportunities uh, to learn more on this one, but we're super excited about it. So today we focus on chain-to-chain -chain oper interoperability, but connecting sort of off-chain systems and infrastructure to blockchains is another key requirement to operating in the tokenized economy. Chainlink is the only platform that can offer end-to-end -end interoperability solutions. We don't have time to get into them all here, but there are a number of other exciting talks all actually in this room today that I encourage you to attend to learn more about the Chainlink runtime environment, the automated compliance engine, and confidential compute. To close this off, tokenization has reached its tipping point moment. We're starting to see real acceleration, uh, but there's still a bright future ahead. Uh, we're seeing growth across many blockchains, which is a lot of opportunity, but also creates fragmentation, inhibiting our ability to capture the benefits of tokenization which means that interoperability is the critical unlock to capturing the liquidity available. Chainlink CCIP is the standard for cross-chain interoperability. So if you are ready to go cross-chain with your asset or your use case, we would love to talk to you, and I'll leave my contact information on the slide. Thanks.